Good evening, everyone. On behalf of everyone at Eversight, I would like to thank you for joining tonight's program, Therapeutic Keratoplasty, When and How. In an effort to eliminate all background noise, all participants will be muted throughout the duration of the webinar. If you would like to ask a question, you may do so by typing your question into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We will address all questions at the end of the webinar. At this time, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Vishal Janji. Dr. Janji is a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He is a corneal specialist and a clinician scientist by training. Dr. Janji completed his ophthalmology training from the prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, India, and his fellowship from the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital, University of Melbourne, Australia. He worked as an associate professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. In 2017, Dr. John D. joined as a professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. John G., I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to go back. Well, it's always good to start with the technical stuff. Thanks so much, uh, Michelle, for that nice, nice introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, my name is Vishal Janji. I work at the University of Pittsburgh, and I want to thank uh, Eversight for uh, organizing this webinar. Um, this is a really, really nice effort um, that helps us uh, teach more people than, than we can ever imagine uh, working from a single center. All right, I do not have any financial disclosures that are relevant to this topic. Uh, I'm gonna reduce this. Okay, so what is therapeutic keratoplasty? So by definition, it is the use of a corneal graft for terminating or improving an actively infectious corneal disease or for repairing an anatomical defect in cornea, which is probably a fancy way to say corneal perforation. Um, so the objectives of therapeutic keratoplasty are to resolve an infectious and inflammatory keratitis, which is refractor, refractory to conventional medical therapy. Um, also, an important objective is to restore the structural integrity of the eye, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. Major indication for a therapeutic keratoplasty is coronal perforation, and again, we will talk more about that in, in other slides, how to avoid reaching that time point. And coronal perforation, obviously, the etiology is either infectious or non-infectious. So in terms of infectious keratitis, uh, in the developing and developed world, there are diff clear differences. Bacterial infections are more commonly seen in the developing world. Uh, when you see a coronal, per coronal perforation, which is secondary to keratitis, you always think about pseudomonas. Even here in the United States, um, most of the contact lens keratitis are caused by pseudomonas. You can also have uh, recalcitrant staph infections. Uh, in, the, in, in the developing world, uh, you also see more fungal keratitis. Fusarium is particularly associated with, with coronal perforation. You can also have aspergillus. Uh, perforation with candida, it, it takes some time. It's not uncommon, but it's not as common as fusarium, I would say. Herpetic eye disease, more commonly seen in the developed uh, world compared to the developing world. Um, that's what we used to think a few years ago, but now with, with increased um, sort of uh, awareness about the existence of herpetic eye disease and also the availability of PCR testing, uh, there are quite a few reports from the developing world as well. When uh, herpetic eye disease becomes necrotizing herpetic keratitis, you can expect a perforation in these patients. And of course, you, you're not, uh, you're not uh, don't forget acanthamoeba, especially in uh, contact lens keratitis cases. Uh, this is a clinical picture showing um, melting soupy cornea, pretty thin in the center and impending perforation in a case of severe pseudomonas keratitis due to contact lens use. Uh, this is another patient with necrotizing uh, herpetic keratitis. If you look carefully, the, it's an impending perforation uh, and sidles with pressure was positive in this patient. Um, sometimes ectasia, severe ectasias can cause a spontaneous coronal perforation. This is a patient who had um, massive keratoconus um, along with pellucid marginal degeneration. And as you can see, the perforation happened 
right at the edge of the thinning um, in where you would expect the pellucid marginal degeneration uh, to show. So I'm just gonna discuss this quickly. In coronal perforation, in general, we treat the associated conditions for small perforations. You can do bandage contact lens with coronal gluing. We'll talk about gluing in a bit again. You can also do an amniotic membrane transplant, a tenons patch or a DALK. For large perforations, you do a therapeutic keratoplasty or a therapeutic sclerokeratoplasty, which is when the perforation is actually extending beyond the limbus. So this is again a very straightforward video. Um, a patient uh, on a sit lamp with fluorescent put in the patient's eye. This is the patient who had um, a corneal glue, um, corneal gluing done uh, to repair a perforation. But you can see the sidle test is still positive at the edge of that glue. You can see the, see the fluid coming out every time the patient blinks. Um, that's another patient with herpetic stromal keratitis. Uh, this is a circular perforation about two and a half to three millimeter in size. Um, so we usually glue these patients on the sit lamp. The idea is to, to remove all the debris. So I wanna uh, pause the video here and just tell you what, what we're trying to do. So basically after cleaning the debris, we punch up out these, these plastic circular discs using skin biopsy punches, usually three millimeter in size or four millimeter in size. You can do more than one patch. Uh, this is a plastic patch. Um, so the edge of the Wexel sponge is actually dipped in uh, lignocaine gel, or you can use erythromycin ointment as well. Once that is done, the plastic disc is gonna stick to the edge of the Wexel sponge. And then the other side of the disc, which is facing the eye, is dipped into a small well containing uh, cyanoacrylate glue. And the whole complex is then put on the cornea. It sticks immediately and you can see it looks pretty clean as opposed to that big mountain of glue that we create sometimes while we are uh, putting glue on a corneal perforation. And as I said, you can, if there's a need, do more than one disc. This is how the perforation looked like. As you can see, it's not a large perforation, but you can see the divot here. The, the, it's pretty sort of clear here. And that's how the leak looks like. This is how, uh, this is right after the coronal gluing. As you can see, there is no mountain of glue. So it's actually easy to put a contact lens on this. And if you're wondering um, where does this disc go, the disc actually stays on the cornea with the glue for as long as you plan to keep the glue on the patient's eye. This is another patient um, just showing um, severe ocular psychiatric pemphigoid. You can see the entropion of the upper lid, massive coronal vascularization. There's an entropion and simbliferon. Um, I, this video just shows how um, on certain lamp you can actually see the aqueous seeping right out of that cornea. There's a tiny perforation. There you go. So we, what we did was instead of putting a patch because the perforation was really tiny, we actually used a small 27 or 30 gauge needle to, so first you dry the this, this surface of the, of the perforation, the epithelium, see the speculum came out because there's hardly any space because the epithelium is off around that perforated area. So once you have identified where the actual hole is, it's not too big. It's probably about one millimeter or even less than that. Once that is dried, you actually dip uh, the tip of the, the needle. Just a tiny amount of glue is sufficient. You just stay there, you have to let it dry uh, because the speculum cannot stay in. So the assistant is actually holding the upper lid. Uh, just give it a few more seconds and then you will see the surface dries up. Once that is done, the leak stops. So that's another way to sort of uh, do coronal gluing without creating that mound of glue, which won't let your contact lens sit there and the patient stays comfortable. So that's what's about gluing. So when, when do we do a therapeutic keratoplasty? So if the ulcer is not gluable, if that's a word, which is usually more than three or four millimeters. Having said that, we, have tried to glue just to tide over time. 
uh, uh, corneal perforations that are larger than three or four millimeters. It, it doesn't work always, but in general, the rule is if the perforation uh, is more than three or four millimeters in size, you, you have to go ahead and, and perform a therapeutic keratoplasty. The second indication is if, when there's a limbal or, or involvement of sclera uh, or limbus, even if there is no perforation, you can go ahead and do a therapeutic keratoplasty or if there's a large impending perforation, perhaps if you remember one of the pictures that I showed of pseudomonas keratitis, that would be a good indication instead of waiting for the, for the perforation to happen. So timing in therapeutic keratoplasty is really, really important. Uh, so you will have, these are three typical cases that we see in the clinic. So if you see a patient like that with limited involvement, infectious keratitis, but limited involvement away from the limbus, you know, vessels are coming in, defect is not too large, there's hardly anything, it is okay to wait. And of course, you have to rely on your microbiology feedback, um, you have to rely on the antibiotic susceptibility data, and you also have to rely on how the patient feels while the patient is being treated. If your patient is getting better, of course, you're moving in the right direction. Then there are patients we are not very sure what needs to be done. So in such patients, we, we follow the rules that I just mentioned. So here, the hypopion is there, but limbus is still spared. You have to keep a very close watch. If this is a staph infection, when you have the antibiotic susceptibility, you can afford to wait. On the other hand, if you do not know what that is, it's been more than a week since you've been treating the patient, the patient is not getting better. It is better to go in um, early uh, rather than waiting, because once this crosses the limbus, then it becomes difficult to manage. And of course, then there are patients where there is absolutely no doubt that you have to go in uh, with a surgical intervention, massive, massive infection, um, almost a corneal abscess, um, almost uh, going into the sclera. So this patient would need uh, a large graft, which would be manually dissected, and it'll have a frill of sclera as well. Hopefully, we'll have a video showing one of those. So once you've decided you're going to go ahead with therapeutic keratoplasty, very important to have a clear-cut pre-op evaluation, detailed examination on the lamp. You have to measure the size of the infiltrate because that is going to determine uh, your um, size of the trephine in its relationship to the limbus. So unlike optical keratoplasty, you do not have to worry too much about the centration. If your um, infiltrate is decentered towards the inferior limbus, it is okay to do a decentered graft uh, rather than doing a very large graft. You also have to look for the degree of thinning and perforation. You do not want to trephine if the thinning is localized because your suturing is gonna be very challenging. And also the status of anterior chamber, whether there are any anterior synechia or not, whether the patient has any got any cataract or not. Now, we always perform, if there's no perforation, especially an ultrasound B scan of the back of the eye. If you are dealing with uh, concomitant enophthalmitis, especially in fungal keratitis, you probably know the visual prognosis is not gonna be great. So at this stage, uh, in a patient, depending on what the status of the eye is, how much the vision is, uh, how, what is the status of the other eye, what is the age of the patient, the discussion can actually go either way. So you can go ahead and, and do a, a, a keratoplasty along with your retina colleagues. Sometimes these patients will also benefit from a temporary K-pro vitrectomy and then a corneal transplantation. So very important to rule out procedural segment disease. Um, as I mentioned initially in one of the slides, it's important to look uh, at what the etiology is in culture-proven keratitis. Uh, the antimicrobial treatment has to continue. Uh, if you do not have an etiological diagnosis, you can put the patient, start the patient on broad-spectrum antibiotics or combination therapy. We do use intravenous mannitol, sometimes before the surgery and sometimes during the surgery to combat the positive vitreous pressure. It helps a lot in open sky um, Keratoplasty. In terms of anesthesia, although I did mention that we use peribulbar, but mostly in, in therapeutic keratoplasty, um, because of the infection and the associated pain, we go for general anesthesia in these patients. Uh, it, it helps a lot and also decreases the positive vitreous pressure. In terms of surgical technique, you got to have a good exposure. Uh, uh, we use lid sutures sometimes, usually a speculum is good enough. You have to avoid any external pressure on the globe so that you do not cause uh, extrusion of the intraocular contents of the eye. We do not use the Flaringa ring anymore because the role of the ring is controversial. I, I do use it when I'm 
operating with my retina colleagues, especially if you're doing a temporary K pro. Um, we take full advantage when we are doing therapeutic keratoplasty. This is a patient who had a fungal infection, um, which we did not know until the patient was on table. So before we embarked on this, you know, huge surgery when he was supposed to have his uh, uh, graft, we did uh, take a sample. Uh, this is braided silk suture. Uh, see how it's being passed actually through the stroma, making sure that it goes through the infiltrate so that you can get some sample. This is a very effective technique if you do not have a diagnosis. You gotta make sure that that suture is not touching too many things, preferably nothing while it's coming through the cornea. Longer the better, it always catches something. And what I do is, I have, I'm have not showing that in this video, when that suture is out, I actually, it's hanging um, in, in, in my left hand and I start cutting that suture in small uh, pieces and directly plating them uh, when the, the nurse is actually holding the plate. So uh, preparation of recipient bed, very important. The goal is to excise all the necrotic or infected tissue. So do not worry about how big your graft is. Do not worry about how good looking your graft is gonna look like. Remember the goal of therapeutic keratoplasty is not visual rehabilitation. Obviously, you know, your patient is gonna hopefully see something, but that is a secondary goal. So you have to measure the involved area using calipers so that you can actually um, plan uh, your uh, uh, therapeutic keratoplasty. So we choose a trephine, which is about one millimeter larger than the size of the lesion. So the main reason is one, that you want to encompass all the infection. Uh, it's you, you're trying to get clear margins. This is very important, especially if you're expecting or suspecting fungal infection. It is also important to choose a larger graph because once you excise, most of these eyes will have inflammatory uh, markers in terms of like anterior synechia or posterior synechia, which makes the chamber a bit shallow. So using a larger graft is actually helpful. So always use a very, very sharp trephine and use minimum pressure on the eye, important points. Sometimes the perforations are there and you know you have to use a manual trephine. We sometimes try and, and you know, so it's difficult to suture these perforations, but you can glue them uh, with fibrin glue. It does help, you know, giving you some sort of temporary uh, sort of counter support or counter pressure actually, so that you can refine them. If that is not happening, you have to do a freehand section, especially if it's a large perforation involving the sclera. Uh, one of the techniques that, that was described by one of my mentors uh, about what, 15 years ago is corneal debulking. So basically when you can't see the interior chamber details preoperatively, but you're sure that there are gonna be a lot of additions, you actually, uh, don't go full thickness in your initial definition. You actually go partial thickness because you don't know how close the iris is to the back of the cornea, the infected cornea. So once you do the initial cut, which is about at 75% depth, um, you do lamellar dissection from the periphery to the center. We remove the superficial part of the corneal button and then you inject viscoelastic. It does improving that initial layer 50 to 75 percent it improves your visualization and you can actually gently dissect it saves a lot of iris tissue so uh, once that is done you have to enter the eye we usually use a sharp instrument a side port for side port entry or you can actually do a guarded entry with interior uh, with a surgical blade as well so as in optical keratoplasty we excise the diseased cornea with the right and left crest of your scissors the scissors um, always always send the corneal specimen for microbiology and also for pathology you'd be surprised uh, how many of these so-called culture negative cases Will, will come back from pathology rather than microbiology with fungal elements. So this is the, the GMS stain uh, showing fungal elements. The, it vents the corneal, uh, the recipient cornea, infected cornea is off. You have to irrigate the interior chamber very gently. Uh, the membrane of the iris is removed because most of these patients will have some sort of membranous um, reaction 
which is which is uh, on the iris on the surface of the iris um, we do inject intrahemoral antifungals and antibiotics as well it is uh, good to use something which is broad spectrum it is okay to use vancomycin if you are suspecting fungal infections uh, use voriconazole that's what we use uh, commonly in our setting additional procedures um, so in principle when you're doing a therapeutic keratoplasty we at least i do a large peripheral iridectomy sometimes i do two one superior and one inferior uh, so that there's no secondary glaucoma um, I, we try and not to touch the lens uh, as much as possible. But yes, if you have endophthalmitis, you will have to remove the lens. And if there's an IOL, generally we end up uh, removing the IOL as well. Donor cornea is prepared after the recipient bed preparation. You have to measure the recipient opening before donor trephination. That's, that's pretty much clear as we discussed. Uh, there's a discrepancy of about one millimeter in size between the donor and the recipient. Always use interrupted sutures in therapeutic keratoplasty. Uh, again, uh, the, the reason being that you don't want to use, use continuous sutures in case there is uh, a reinfection. And also you do anticipate a lot of inflammation in these patients, in these corneas. Uh, you can, I've never done a therapeutic with 16 sutures really. You always end up doing 18, 20, sometimes 24 sutures. Um, bites are going to be longer because of the inflammation, the vascularization. You'd be surprised that you think you did tight suturing, but sutures become loose in a couple of months in these patients sometimes. So these are just some examples of uh, patients who had a massive tunnel infection, and then they added, ended up having a large graft. Also a patient here uh, with a chronic perforation due to PUK, sterile, and ended up having a large graft. So post-op management, but the most important thing is to prevent recurrence of infection. You have to continue the antimicrobial therapy. This is very important, especially if you have fungal keratitis. So you have to continue with your antifungal therapy. Uh, uh, take measures to promote the reepithelization of the corneal epithelium. Sometimes we do start uh, these patients on autologous serum eye drops and preservative-free artificial tear drops. It is important to control the inflammation. The role of corticosteroids is controversial especially in fungal keratitis. So if a patient has known fungal keratitis or suspected fungal keratitis, we do not start steroids for, for the first three to four weeks after the surgery. It is okay to, for these patients to have cyclosporinide drops. Um, if you can't uh, get compounded cyclosporinide drops, it is okay to use the commercially available 0.05% or 0.09% cyclosporinide drops while you're waiting uh, to start corticosteroid eye drops. The um, visual prognosis, as I said, is although a secondary outcome, it depends on the etiological agent, um, uh, underlying corneal pathology, severity of ocular inflammation, and the size of the graft. <clears throat> this is uh, a video showing a massive corneal infection. It's an old video. Uh, you can see how it, the, the whole cornea is involved. And once you take up the whole cornea, um, uh, there's a there's a membrane on the iris. Uh, the whole iris is so, not the whole iris. A, a large part of the iris is actually necrotic, and then you do a large graft, which is uh, is clearly shown as freehand dissection. Uh, this graft is not going to stay on the eye with 16 stitches. You will need at least 24 stitches for a for a patient like this. So I want to show you one more video uh, with some teaching points. Uh, so this is a patient uh, who had recurrence of fungal infection. I'm going to speed it up a little bit uh, after the first graft. So once the first graft was done, um, you can see there is there are exudates in the interior chamber, and we did not we were not able to um, get fungus. Uh, or fungal elements in second scrape, but because the first graft was due to fungal infection, uh, it was clear that this is going to be most likely fungal infection only. So the previous sutures, this is under general anesthesia, the previous sutures were removed. Uh, we were expecting a lot of bleeding. And I don't know whether you can sort of appreciate, there's a lot of NVI in the eye, on the iris actually, in addition to uh, vessels uh, everywhere in the interior chamber. So 
entry into the interior chamber, some viscoelastic to sort of create some space. Um, so it is easy to do a regraft in these patients. You have to remove the- Dr. Janji, I don't mean to interrupt, but we, we can't see the video. Oh, I'm so sorry. Maybe, you know what? It's a black I, screen. No, no, I have to, I have to share it again. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. Oh, thank you for interrupting me. No problem. Okay, all right, here we are. There it is, yep. I'm gonna restart again. The description, uh, this is fungal reinfection um, in a coronal graft, so all sutures are removed. Um, and again, as, as, as was mentioning, there, there's a lot of neovascularization on the iris. There's actually blood vessels sort of uh, uh, over the, the inflammatory exudate inside the interior chamber as well. So let's speed this up a bit more. So the first step is to remove all the stitches. Once that is done, uh, interior chamber entry is made uh, to create some space in the eye. So it is easy, as I was mentioning, to um, remove this graft because you, all you have to do is uh, sort of find that plane. And once that is done, you can basically peel that graft, uh, but you have to make sure that there's enough uh, viscoelastic in the interior chamber before you're doing that. And there's a lot of bleeding that you can expect. Uh, <clears throat> This is all viscoelastic coming back. These are Azar scissors. Uh, if you don't have Azar scissors, you can use the right and left scissors as well. So I'm using viscoelastic as well, and just to make sure that I'm not touching the iris or damaging the iris. So once that is off, you definitely need an assistant in these patients because there's going to be a lot of bleeding. So once that is done, you take a breather just to figure out what you're looking at. Um, and there you see uh, there's still uh, some inflammatory membranes in the center. Um, and also you can see uh, there's a large exudate in the center and the pupil is actually festooned. It's sort of stuck down. I want to show you this again um, here. So while I'm removing this membrane, I realize that that actually is the interior capsule of the lens. And it's too late now because the initial plan was to leave the cataract inside because the patient did not have endophthalmitis. Um, so there you go, uh, lenticular material, a lot of bleeding, and we don't know what is going to happen. And so we finally decide that we can't leave that lens inside the eye now. Uh, so we'll have to take it out. So you do very careful and slow dissection and try and peel off whatever you can without damaging the iris tissue. And my goal here is to remove as much lens material um, uh, as we can without damaging the iris. So let's speed this up a little bit more. See, it takes a lot of time to sort of remove all the membranes from the center as well as from the periphery. This is, uh, I'm removing the, the ledge of the coronal tissue from the previous graft. Um, sort of waiting for the bleeding to stop as well, if I'm lucky enough. It's basically, if you can see the tiny vessels on the iris, so I'm trying to stretch the iris because, you know, the goal is now to remove that cataract. Um, so some viscodilation and sort of trying to 
take the cataract out. There you go. Once that is done, um, again, some, some use of viscoelastic. And here I usually tell my anesthesiologist to try and give some mannitol. Uh, we are not gonna put a lens inside that because it, this is massive infection. So a secondary eye oil can be planned later on. Again, you can still see some residual cortical matter. I'm using a Simcoe cannula, a manual uh, irrigation and aspiration to take out the remaining cortical matter and also viscoelastic. The capsule is still intact. So this is Simcoe cannula again, sucking out um, all the cortical matter. So once I'm confident that there's nothing else or very little left, which is hopefully not gonna have um, any impact, just checking everywhere and there's no cortical matter left. We did the created an inferior PI. I'm hoping everyone can, can see that. I'm trying to create, let's, let's look at this. So I'm trying to create the angle, basically, you know, making sure that I can break the PAS, pre-existing peripheral interior sinicae, which is quite a difficult job uh, in these patients. So the use of viscoelastic is important uh, to separate the iris from the periphery of the cornea. So we're still lucky if you, if you noticed that the infection is actually um, still away from the limbus. I'm just trying to take out that tiny fibrin or fibrinous membrane from the edge of the pupil. Creating space. And I think we're nearly done. So the Let's look at this once more. So this is towards the end of the uh, so whole dissection that we did. Um, putting viscoelastic. Again, making sure the angle is open. Putting more viscoelastic and after that, putting a donor cornea um, on top of it. Uh, this is about a nine and a half to 10 millimeter graph. So the rest uh, of suturing is, is pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, screen share, um, here we are. So going back to the presentation, can you see my screen again? It's on the uh, screen that says video. Yeah. There yeah. you go, complications. So, uh, yes. so let's talk a bit about complications. So there are two phases of, of complications seen in these patients, early phase, which, which is within the first two weeks and the late phase. In the early phase, some of the complications are pretty similar to what you see after a routine or conventional full thickness transplant, wound gape, shallow AC, persistent inflammatory reaction. You can see pretty quick <coughs> PAS coming back or posterior sinicae developing. IOP can be elevated uh, because you know a lot was done during these uh, procedures. Uh, persistent epithelial defect, which is one of the main issues, especially if the infection has been long-standing, and that is why, as I mentioned previously, many of these patients they benefit a lot from the use of autologous ceramide drops. Uh, but the worst of all is reinfection, especially in fungal keratitis. Uh, late complications expected: cataract, glaucoma, infection of the graft, graft rejection because the grafts are, are large. They sometimes they they cross the limbus. Endothelial decomposition. Never be worried about that. You can do a repeat transplant if the eye is fine, if the interior stroma is clear, you can also go ahead and do an EK later on. Graft ectasia, not seen very commonly, but if you have a large graft that can happen inferiorly, and of course the eye can go into thysis, you have to be prepared, the patient has to be prepared for that. So epithelial defect, large, uh, this is about post-op week, uh, day six, um, still pretty big for day six. So these, these patients, as I said, they benefit a lot from 
uh, the usual management of epithelial defect, which starts with preservative free artificial tear drop, a AMT, bandage contact lens, and uh, auto serum drops, and sometimes tarsorophy. Peripheral anterior synechia, as I was mentioning, especially in large rafts, this is one of the reasons we use a larger graft instead of um, oversizing this by 0.5, we try and oversize this by one millimeter. In graft infiltrate, which is a reinfection, uh, you know, the first two patients are fungal keratitis, the third one is bacterial infection, where uh, the graft was large, not large enough to encompass all the infection. And visual outcomes, as I mentioned, we can skip that though, a causative organism is important. Uh, susceptibility to treatment of that organism. If you are treating something that was already responding partially to your medical treatment, but you ended up doing a therapeutic transplant, the outcomes are going to be good. Um, severity of inflammation, as you saw in that video, a lot of bleeding happened, a lot of inflammation uh, is expected uh, post-operatively. Timing of the surgery, as I mentioned, if you are too late, if the infection has crossed the limbus, the prognosis is going to be guarded. Type of donor material used is not relevant here in the United States, but there are places where you, you won't find good quality optical um, uh, corneal tissue uh, to be used in therapeutic retroplasty. You can also use vision grafts here. You can also use uh, glycerine preserved corneas in the developing world. Uh, uh, size of the graft, as we know, larger the graft, more the risk of higher the risk of failure and underlying ocular surface disorder, which can cause persistent epithelial defects. And of course, there can be post-operative management of these complications. If there are too many complications in the post-operative period, the, the visual outcomes are not expected to be great. Outcomes, so we look at them at Two, uh, in, uh, in two ways, cure rate, which is eradication of disease. That's the main goal of therapeutic retroplasty, as I've said it only five, to five times earlier. Success rate is also uh, defined as the clarity of the graph. So if you look at this review that you know, was published more than 10 years ago, the cure rate for bacterial infection was, was actually pretty good, 90, more than 90% for fungus. It was variable, still not too bad. Viral was good, as good as bacteria, and acanthamoeba was variable, 45 to 86%. One of the main reasons, and of course, acanthamoeba needs a separate lecture, right? it's such a big topic, is that the detection of disease, uh, the organism itself is pretty late. The success rate, which is clarity of, with a clear graft, is, is not as encouraging as a cure rate. So most of these patients, they will end up needing a repeat uh, optical corneal transplant at a later date. Um, I'm just going to discuss briefly about the patch graft indication when the perforation is too small for a full-size keratoplasty and too large for gluing. Um, usually five millimeter or less, we still use skin biopsy punches in some of the, these patients. Um, most common indication, at least in our setting, is uh, uh, peripheral ulcerative keratitis leading to a perforation, which is about four, four and a half, five millimeter in size. And the patch graft patients do very well, depending on the location of the perforation. If it's away from the center, you can expect good visual outcomes. If it's close to the center, sometimes folks would do a full thickness seven millimeter graft, or you can do a two-stage procedure where you can, in a hot eye, do a patch graft, and a few months down the line, you can do a repeat central optical keratoplasty. Uh, this is a patient um, with the uh, a PUK massive. You can see uh, a melting of the cornea, the periphery, and you actually, you can, you do a crescentic shape patch graft, uh, which is uh, not for visual rehabilitation clearly, but it's to basically to save the integrity of the globe. <clears throat> So to con conclude, therapeutic keratoplasty is the final option for management of severe uncontrolled keratitis. Um, it has to be considered only if absolutely indicated. It is surgically different from an optical keratoplasty and post-op care includes emphasis on systemic, um, I should say actually local and systemic antimicrobial therapy. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. As noted uh, previously, if you do have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. And we do have a couple of questions, Dr. Janji. The first one is, what do you prefer if compounded, 1% cyclosporine or less? You're on mute, Dr. Janji, I can't hear you. 
something can you here there we go yeah okay um so i we do prefer using at least 0.5 percent cyc cyclosporin eye drops uh, but yes if you have a compounding pharmacy it is okay to get up to one percent um, there are studies that have been done where people have used 2% cyclosporin, um, but what we've seen is anything uh, between 0.5% and 1%, or if you have, as I said, 0.5% exactly or 1% exact, you can use that while you're waiting to start these corticosteroid eye drops. An important thing to consider is that if you are planning to start cyclosporin eye drops, try and start them a few weeks um, before your planned transplant so that while the patient uh, you know, has some sort of perioperative cover using these cyclosporin eye drops. Um, I have colleagues who would use um, um, oral steroids instead of topical steroids. A medrol dose pack is very commonly used in the United States. Um, I have had some good success in patients where I did not know they had fungal infections but I've seen if your patient has a fungal infection, definitely, definitely microbiologically proven before the therapeutic transplant, I try not to give them uh, uh, oral steroids as well because of the fear of a flare up. Okay, the next question is how did you make that crescentic patch graft? So it, it's usually, it can be done in two ways. And there are multiple ways that have been described actually in the in peer-reviewed literature. One is that you can actually use two different size large trephines. And if you do not have access to large trephines, usually manual trephines can go up to 11 or 12 millimeters, um, not the suction trephines. Uh, use, uh, talk to your eye bank. As eye banks usually have um, uh, access to large trephines because that's what they use. You can use two different size trephines and, and be creative and actually create uh, a, a moon-shaped graph. And do not worry if you don't wanna use um, you know, a trephine or you don't have access to trephine to get a perfect cut. You can actually do a freehand dissection as well. So um, you can um, mount the cornea <clears throat> onto a stand um, in the OR and actually do a freehand dissection to get a crescentic patch graft. But what I've seen is usually um, if you use two different size trephines, you should be able to get uh, a crescent, which is sometimes larger than what you need, but it's okay to have a larger graft uh, compared to a smaller graft. Okay, and I think this question is uh, based off this answer. Can you explain what this is made of? and use the artificial patch and fix it by ointment? Is it customized from bandage contact lens? I didn't get the question. What, what are we asking about? It says, can you explain how it is made of and use the artificial patch and fix it by ointment? Is it customized from oh, a bandage contact that. lens? So I'm gonna presume that this is a question on corneal gluing technique, the one where I showed the plastic patch. So I'm gonna go ahead and describe that. Uh, basically, the plastic patch is trephined from your plastic drape that you use on the eye during any surgery, cataract surgery. Um, you can use, as I mentioned, a skin biopsy punch to create different size discs, plastic patches uh, from your uh, eye drape, from your ophthalm ophthalmic drape. So once you have those, uh, I usually create a bunch of those because it's easy uh, to sort of lose them and they just fly away. Um, uh, that patch, uh, as I said, it's made from plastic. I, used, I take a Wexel sponge on the end of, at the end of the sponge, the tip of the sponge, um, I would uh, put some erythromycin ointment and then that ointment will help uh, me to get the patch um, uh, stick to the end of the Wexel sponge. I hope that makes sense. Um, once that is done, I will dip that, that disc, plastic disc, into a well of corneal glue, and then I'll put it on the corneal perforation. So as I mentioned during that video as well, uh, I hope I can, I can actually show that video. Hold on. It might be easier to sort of go back in. Here we are. 
um, then let me know if my screen's not visible. So if you look at this, um, so once that is dried off and you know the mucus, the debris is off. So basically, now here, this is pretty good actually. So that's the end of the Vexel sponge. You can see the ointment sort of blob hanging here. This is the plastic disc, which has been refined using a skin biopsy punch. Um, so the ointment is helping the disc uh, to stick to this wax cell. And the other end of the disc, the other side of the disc, I should say, has been dipped into a well of cyanoacrylate glue. So this whole thing, as I showed earlier, will go onto the cornea. Of course, that other side has got glue, which is going to stick to the cornea and seal the perforation. I Dr. hope that Jonathan, makes there's sense. a there's a uh, question regarding the well of glue. It says, "Can you uh -huh. explain the well of glue? What okay, are you, all right. What are you so, putting the glue into? Which cyanocrylate do you use that allows you to do this?" Well, so cyanoacrylate glue is available. The commercially available histacryl. I I don't have a picture here. Um, I mean, you know, uh, so basically the glue is available in a, in a tiny sort of uh, tube. So we cut the tip of the tube and squeeze in the liquid glue in a plastic cup. So that is the well of the glue, or the well with the glue. Um, I hope I could, um, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I have that presentation here, but look, whoever has asked this question, please email me and I'll send you pictures uh, of what I'm talking about. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that uh, the glue, which is commercially available, it comes in tiny tubes. It's liquid, obviously. So I, you can cut that tube, squeeze in that glue, which is in liquid form in a plastic cup. And then you can dip your disc which is stuck to the end of a wax cell sponge in that plastic cup and then put it on the cornea. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Please email me and I'll be happy to send you pictures. Okay, next question is, what is the role of tectonic DSEC in corneal thinning disorders? So I, I honestly, I have not done tectonic DSEC. Uh, I think Dr. Elmer too had published uh, one of the earliest case reports, if I'm not mistaken. You, I mean, there is, unless you have a specific kind of perforation, which is sort of, I think what Elmer had published was, uh, it was, uh, he had done that more for, uh, uh, for a patient with high drops and thinning, if I'm not mistaken, but I have not used a tectonic d graft for corneal thinning or perforation. Um, I don't see a point of using a partial thickness tissue um, uh, for, uh, for a perforation, uh, especially uh, endothelial tissue. So uh, if you have to do a, a, a patch graft, which is lamellar, uh, I, would, I would do a sort of, uh, I, would, I would wanna put in more stroma with sutures there uh, compared to only the endothelial tissue. Okay, next question is in dealing with fungal related therapeutic PK, do you find an additional benefit of having a cornea button prepared in Optisol mixed with Ampho B? So yeah, well, so we do not mix anything in our, um, in our storage media. Um, instead of <clears throat> using M4B in the storage media. I mean, of course, the next question would be for how long are you going to put it in? And that's a whole, don't miss the AAO subspeciality day, by the way, if you want to part of, be a part of that discussion. Um, we don't, I don't use that. I would rather use intracameral uh, antifungals, uh, which, which would be more helpful. Um, if I get, if the pharmacy is, if my internal pharmacy is, is uh, generous enough, they will send me a sort of a one mil syringe full of um, the cho my choice of antifungal drug so that not only will I use it intracamerally, I can actually, I sometimes use it to irrigate the angle as well. So I don't waste the drug at all. 
Um, so, but I, I don't use anything in the storage media because, you know, we still don't know if that's going to be useful or not and to, to what extent. Okay, and it looks like we have one last question. In case of limbal involvement, do you prefer to do 360 degree per peritomy for a large corneal scleral graft? Yes, you can, you can, that's a good question. And I think surgically that it's a, it's a very sound decision for two reasons. One, when you have limbal involvement in, in a large uh, infection, you cannot tell for sure whether uh, the edge of your trephination is encompassing all the infection or not. So there were times when uh, you have fungal infection that would have a tiny lip of, of extension into the sclera in one quadrant. So you have to really either excise it manually or use a really large trephine to do a sclerokeratoplasty. The second uh, reason is that you, uh, your suturing is much better if you do a 360 degree peritomy. Uh, so it, that, that's a fantastic surgical question. I did not have a video on that, but you know, that's, that's something that we do if the infection extends beyond the limbus especially. Hi, it looks like there are no more open questions. So I'm going to uh, wrap it up. I would like to thank everyone again for joining us tonight. The webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website to view on demand. A very special thank you to Dr. Janji for serving as our speaker today and for providing us with your invaluable expertise on this subject. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so much and thank you, Everside. Thank you.